Everyone's sexual preferences are different, but fetishes are universal. They're oddly satisfying, and they can make us feel like we're on top of the world, even if we're on the bottom. But the line gets blurry when fetishes and other sexual preferences become less about what you do in the bedroom and more about who you do. So, are all fetishes created equal? First, let's take a step back and look at what exactly is a fetish. A fetish is a sexual attraction to an object. It can be a sexual attraction to a part of the body that is traditionally viewed as non-sexual in nature. This is Tamara Turner. She's a psychotherapist at the Gender and Sexuality Therapy Center in New York City, with a focus on identity, kink, and fetishes. Tamara says fetishes can include balloons, fur, hands, cameras. All of these can trigger a biological or chemical reaction in the brain that leads to sexual arousal. So is there anything that can't be a fetish? I don't think so. And while not a lot of studies exist about how fetishes develop, partly because of the stigma attached to them, we have some clues. We know that there are parts of the brain, for example, that control sensory functioning for genitalia are close to uh, the sensory functioning that also controls feet, for example, so that can explain foot fetish. And we've known about fetishes for a really long time. I would argue that Fetishes are as old as humanity itself. This is Hallie Lieberman, a sex historian, journalist, and author of Buzz, a stimulating history of the sex toy. The first guy to kind of categorize fetishes was Richard von Kraft Ebing. An Austro-German psychiatrist in the late 1880s who wrote the iconic book Psychopathia Sexualis. Kraft Ebing was the first guy to actually kind of categorize fetishes and to put them on the map sexology-wise. He documented all sorts of fetishes, from the more innocuous, like beautiful hands and gloves, to the more sinister ones, like necrophilia. While many of the fetishes that Kraft Ebing recorded are still seen as unconventional today, the taboo on others has been lifted over time. We've seen women's liberation, queer liberation, all of these things have led to sexuality breaking down in ways that it never has before. This is Noah Michelson. He is the editorial director of HuffPost Personal. Noah says things get trickier when a fetish focuses on people who identify with a certain race, gender, or other community. A lot of it has to do with power dynamics. When we're talking about fetishizing for, say, a person with disabilities, or a woman, or someone from a certain race or culture. So often what that has to do with is the power dynamic with the other person being part of a group that has power over that person. So instead of seeing that person as a whole entity, or seeing that person as a person, they're actually just seeing that small part of them. I should have talked to her. I love Chinese women. Isn't that a little racist? If I like their race, how can that be racist? If you're someone who has more power in that situation and what you're getting off on is the power that you have over that group, that's not okay. Tamara believes that oftentimes they're influenced by the culture that we're in, by um, racism, sexism, all the isms, um, white supremacy and capitalism. And yet, even if our desires have problematic origins, we can't control our desires. The only thing that we can control are our thoughts and our behaviors. We can try to alter our thinking and also make sure that we are behaving in a way um, that's appropriate. And it turns out identity-based fetishes can also be healing, especially for people who have been told that their sexuality is either doesn't exist, like for a lot of people with disabilities, or that their sexuality is deviant or non-normative, like queer people. I think having someone celebrate you for who you are and wanting to engage with you um, and be part of a sexual relationship, I think that can be really empowering. And engaging in fetish-based acts together can help partners break through stereotypes and be a way of taking back that power um, that you otherwise feel in normal day-to-day -day life um, you might not have and that you might not be able to play with so much. And I don't think anyone should have the right to say that what someone is interested in or if they're interested in letting someone else be interested in them for whatever reason that that's wrong. Uh, I think we have to let people have agency to decide how they want to be seen, how they want to see, 
and what that's going to look like.